I've been speaking a lot in my life about the prophet Elijah. Elijah is the one who told the king there would be a drought. And Elijah is the one who, who challenged Baal's prophets. That whoever's God would rain a, a fire from heaven would be the true God. And our God showed up and showed out. And the thing you have to understand about Elijah, Elijah never saw death the way that we're going to see death. The Bible said Elijah was caught up by a whirlwind and his servant Elisha was promised that if he was there when Elijah was called up that he would receive a double portion of his power. And the Bible shows us that Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And in this passage we're going to be looking at this morning, in Kings chapter 6, Elijah's in the process of training younger men. I love this passage because I think it's important for us, especially on a day like grandparents. Sunday. You know? Grandparent Sunday. Because Elisha, this incredible man of God, found it necessary to take a younger generation and pour into them the knowledge that's been given to him. And I don't know when, when this took place. Probably back when uh, Billy, Billy Graham was preaching his crusades, he would bring all these tens of thousands of people into the into these stadiums. And he, he'd have these revivals. And then he would send people back to the local church. And so there was a period in the church history where, where they, had, they, they believed. They believed that they just showed up and opened up the doors, people would come in. People just would just come in. I don't know, I don't know what it was about this. People used to always say to me when I first got in the ministry, church isn't like it used to be, Abram. Church is not like it used to be, where everybody went to church. Well, here's the thing, guys. That has never happened in the history of the church where people just showed up to show up. You might think that's the way it was. You might think that's what was happening when you were younger. But the reason every family and every person in our community used to go to church, the reason why people used to pray in school, the reason people would, would show up and show respect to the church in our communities is because the people in those churches went out and made sure that the church was a staple in the community. Pastors didn't shy away from speaking the truth and being honest with people. Somewhere along the way, we were told that it's the pastor's job to evangelize. It, it's the pastor's job to, to do all the hospital visits. It's the pastor's job to make all the phone calls. It's the pastor's job to eat lunch with every single member of the church. That's why most pastors weigh over 400 pounds. You know what I'm saying? We don't beat, beat us. I don't know why y'all do that. You know, we think it was the pastor's job to have his door open uh, anytime he wants. You just come in and barge in and talk to him. Like this is what we do, and most pastors accepted that job, and it's, and it's, it's become it's become the expectation. But here's the thing you have to understand: in the 1800s, Baptist churches in Northern Kentucky. You know what they used to do? They used to have this thing called the traveling meetings. Traveling meetings, where the church members would get together and they would travel down the street and go to other's houses and they would have a big old church service and they said people would, would see them coming down the street and their neighbors and they would jump into the traveling you know circus and they would go with them to all the, they said revivals were breaking out with the church members it was one of the most impressive things flag springs used to do it i think one of the, the, the 12 mile churches used to do it you know what i'm saying it was crazy large crowds of people and, and here's the thing they did that because they understood what the bible said that everybody is a christian should care for one another's burdens. You know what I just said? We're supposed to care for one another's burdens. It, it used to be the parents' job to raise our kids in our homes. But you see, the parents, we're too busy with Netflix and, and Facebook. We don't have time to make God a priority in our kids' lives. We would rather the school teach our kids what's important. We would rather the, the church and only get our kids for an hour than teach our kids what's important. And then when they get behind the closed doors of your house, we think they deserve a break from God. Y'all did good this week. Y'all went to school. You went to kids on the move. You went to Sunday school. Y'all are in the house. Y'all can have a break from God. I would even venture to say that kids are being exposed to the world more so in our own homes. Through the TV that we watch, the sites they visit, the words that you say, than they do anywhere else. I believe with all my heart. And grandparents, this is especially important for you guys because in a world where the adult kids are refusing to take responsibility, there are more grandparents raising their grandchildren than ever before. Instead of seeing it as a burden that you fail somehow with your adult kids or that you're supposed to be in your golden years where you should be in Florida on a boat drinking margaritas or whatever you do in Florida, okay? Here's what you got to start doing. You need to realize that your job is not done until God calls you home. 
God calls you home. You may not have a, 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 a say in how your grandchildren are raised, but while they're in your house, you have every right to teach them about what God has done for you. If you've experienced God in a transforming way, then you need to pass it on to the next generation. I've been thinking a lot about my, uh, my grandmother. We called her Nanny. All right? I don't know why they did that, but they did it. They called her Nanny. She watched us. We didn't call her. I mean, I don't know what else we'd call her. We all called her Nanny. You know? And, and uh, I've been thinking a lot about her lately. We went, I used to play hooky. You know what I'm saying? I used to get sick at school. <laughs> Just so I could go to Nanny's house. You know? When, when we got our license to drive, we would go over, we'd go to Nanny's house after school and before ball practice, and she would just feed us stacks and stacks of pancakes. It was the most glorious thing in the world. And uh, <laughs> what I didn't realize at the time, but I realized later in life, is that as I was sitting there eating all those stacks of pancakes, Nanny was pouring into me some wisdom and knowledge. And I remember one day she was watching Will of, Will of Fortune or something weird, you know, doing her little crossword puzzle at the table, smoking her cigarette, and uh, you know what I'm saying? And I, I said, I said, Nanny, the world is falling apart, everything, everything seems to be going chaotic. I said, why don't you ever seem worried? Why aren't you freaking out like everybody else? And she said, honey, I've seen wars. She said, I've seen depressions. She said, when she was a kid, they used to have to be real careful because real life gangsters would come to town, all right, from Newport or something like that. Newport, I guess, was a bustling town one day, one time. George Ramos, I think he, okay, I think he's buried in one of the cemeteries here in Fountain. I think, I, I think that's where they got great gasping from. We don't know our history in Fountain. This is the craziest thing. We got some pretty cool people in Fountain. It like disappeared when the flood didn't happen, I think. But, she said, I've gone through all these things. I've gone through the flood. I've gone through all these things. And she lost her husband. She's gone through sickness. And, and she said, no matter what I went through, honey, she said, God always got me through it. Always. At the time I prayed last, I said, okay, nanny. You know? But when Ebola came to us and everybody was screaming the world was ending, you all remember that? We, we freaked out about Ebola. You know? Guess what? I didn't have to worry about it. When Zika came around, all the pregnant women were like, I gotta stay inside the house. Okay, the Zika virus is coming. Everybody was panicking. I didn't, I didn't have to worry about that. Right? When North Korea was supposed to destroy our country, when the recession hit, when the pandemic hit, when all these world-ending ending problems showed up, and the whole world panicked like they never experienced anything like it before in all of human history, I always remember what my nanny said to me at that kitchen table. God will get you through it. I could end my sermon right there and call it a day because for a lot of us, we need to remember that no matter what you walk in here dealing with, no matter what is happening in the world, no matter how anybody makes you feel, God will always get you through. He is in all things. He's in control of all things. He holds all things together. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's all stand for reading this holy word. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting on verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 6. Now the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, Behold, now the place before you where, where, where we are living is too cramped for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let us take from there a beam and let us construct a place for ourselves to live there. And so he said, go. Then one of them said, well, please agree and go with your servants. Elisha said, I'll go. And so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But it happened as one of them was cutting down a beam. The axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, oh, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick. He threw it in the, in the water. And he made the iron flow. Then he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand. And he took it. May God bless reading this holy word. You may be seated. I pray that as we celebrate our grandparents today. I pray that the young people of our church will sit there and look for somebody who is old. That can sit there and give them some good wisdom in their life. I pray that the older generation in this church would begin to pray for one of these younger people. That you can start blessing in some way, shape, or form. Because none of us is going to be here forever. And for the last 30 to 40 years, the church has dropped the ball when it came to teaching and training the next generation. Our churches were, were filled in the 70s and 80s with the revival. And we thought for some reason we had something to do with it. And then when the numbers began.
began to drop. We started to look for new ways to reach young people. So we started to change the music. And we started to dim the light so nobody could see us worship. During that same time, 9-11 happened. 9-11 took our nation to its knees. People began to swarm the church because they were scared. They were looking for answers. They had questions. They didn't know where to go. And instead of the church taking advantage of, of, of all the people being in our churches and teaching and discipling and mentoring and growing, what we did was we thought it was the music that brought them in. We thought it was our fancy preaching that brought them in. We, we thought it was the fancy stages and our fancy life and the fancy technology that brought them in. And here we are 20 years removed and we're seeing the lowest baptisms in all of the nation. We're, 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 seeing, we're, seeing, we're seeing churches close one right after another. And the same thing is said over and over again. I don't know what's going on in our communities. Family isn't what it used to be. Well, guess what? I know exactly what happened in our community. We kicked God out. And we let Satan have a field day. But I'm here to tell you, church, that today I'm making a commitment of repentance for the past sins of the church. And we're going to proclaim that as long as we have air to breathe and another day on this earth, we're going to fight for our communities, we're going to fight for one another, and we're going to fight so that God is glorified. Amen. Here we see this young man cutting down a tree, and this tree was used to, uh, to, was going to be used as a, a large beam so the young men of God could continue to do the, the work of God. And as he's cutting down this tree, the axe fell, the axe head fell into the water, and this man was devastated. He was devastated. When I read this, I almost picture one of my kids eating like an ice cream cone. They take that lick, and the top of the ice cream does what? It falls right off into the ground. And instead of them doing the five second rule of picking it up and eating it, they pan it. I was kidding. I, uh, they, they, uh, instead of sitting there going, hey, I need another ice cream cone, and me taking them in very nicely and calmly and getting them another scoop of ice cream, what they do is they go, oh! My world is over. They freak out. You know? This young man says, Here I am. I'm working for the Lord. I'm going to make a, build a bigger place. I'm doing what I should be doing. He wasn't out partying with all his friends. He wasn't having a good time. He's trying to do his best behavior. Have you ever felt like this, guys? Have you ever felt like bad things always happen to good people and good things always happen to bad people? You want to know why that is? I'll give you. The reason you think that is because bad people are much better at camouflaging what is going on behind closed doors than you and I. F football season is starting back up, guys, and uh, there's one driving commercial that we're going to see. When y'all watch the Bengals today, guess what? There's going to be one commercial that we're going to see over and over and over. It's going to be on every commercial break. We're going to see it over and over again. The commercial is going to say, you cannot enjoy football without cracking open a cold one. And everybody's going to be, they're going to be showing all these shots of everybody having a good time tailgating and laughing and having a good time and smiling. And, and to the 18-year-old boy who's about to go off to college, he goes, that looks awesome. People look like you're having a good time. But as a pastor who spends hours counseling people in our community, when I see those commercials, I see that 18-year-old 20 years down the road who's going to lose his family, he's going to lose his job, he's going to lose his liver because he's an alcoholic who can't remember what happened last night. Because he bought into this lie that being blackout drunk is somehow fun and important to his self-worth. Y'all care that I preach to you today? Because some of y'all aren't, aren't getting this. Everything we do has a consequence, whether it's good or bad. And at some point, we need to stop looking at this world in the way Satan wants us to see it. Fun and enticing and exciting and temporarily satisfying. And we need to see it for what it's worth. God doesn't want us to live temporarily satisfied. He wants us to live a full and abundant life. And you cannot have a full and abundant life if all you do is live in the parameters of the world. Amen. Can't do it. I just heard this week, uh, uh, Sugary Kids Siri. You know what I'm saying? Some of my favorites, okay? Captain Crunch, Lucky Charms, Cocoa Puffs, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, Fruity Pebbles, Fruit Loops. I mean, all these kids cereal. The, 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 Y'all can look this up. Y'all go to Walmart today or wherever you go, why it's wherever. Look this up. Go down the cereal aisle. All these characters, these cartoon characters, these cartoon characters are not for me and you, they're for the kids. What are they all doing? They're all looking down. All of them. Captain Crump. Captain. You know what I'm saying? The 
a little bird. Toucan bird. Looking down. They're all looking down. All. You wonder why they're doing that? So when a kid walks down the aisle, and they look up, these dumb kids <laughs> are going to see these characters on these cereal boxes looking at them. And they figured out that if a kid sees a, a, a toucan bird looking at them, they go, I want that. And then they'll start throwing a fit. And if they throw a fit, us parents want to be quiet and so say, shut up, I'll put it in the car. You know? Here's my point, guys. It tastes delicious. You know what I'm saying? I love some cinnamon toast crunch. You know? You give me a bowl of cap crunch, I'm happy for the day. I love it. I can eat a whole box. I can do it. Here's the thing, it tastes delicious. But when you turn 40 and you get diabetes, it ain't that good anymore. You know what I'm saying? We used to say cigarettes were healthy for us, right? We know how that turned out. Every drug addict that fills our streets that you guys complain about all the time at one point thought they had some control over the drug. They thought it felt good. But the way drugs work is you first, you know, you, it, it, it first seems fun, it seems like it's, it's good, uh, and then it hooks you. Where you become dependent on it in your brain thinks if you don't have it, you're gonna die. And so you give up everything just to get a hit or, or, or a drink or an injection. And you say, Abram, hey, why are you telling us all this today? It's supposed to be fun day, it's supposed to be grandparent Sunday. Because as Christians, it's time for us to grow up. Amen. And then start recognizing that when Christ asks you to surrender your life for him, he is asking you to surrender everything. Everything. Because he knows that Satan's going to use anything he can to try and control you. And Satan's been doing this from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Did God really say you couldn't eat that fruit? Yes! He did! He said, don't eat it! But did he really? Did, he, did, did God really say you couldn't cuss? Really did he? Did God really say you had to go to church? You know? Did God really say you couldn't watch that? Did God really say you couldn't sleep with whoever you wanted to sleep with? This is how Satan has operated from the beginning of time. Here, here's what I want you to know about this passage. We see two different responses from two different faithful people. These are both of these people are faith. One is young in their faith, the other is mature in his faith. And so there are two things I want you guys to walk away with today. When life hits you, you have two responses. You can, you can either continue to be immature in your faith, or you can start to become mature and understand that God is in control of all things, He holds all things together, and, uh, you know, He's in all things, all right? This young man, when the axe fell in the water, he didn't even hesitate. He didn't even try to retrieve it. He didn't even try to find a solution for it, right? He did what? He panicked. He went straight to complaining. That was borrowed. <laughs> That's the funniest thing I've ever read in my life. Falls in the water. Oh, that was borrowed. Weird, man. He, he, was, he was in a panic. And, and here's the thing. He doesn't, he doesn't go, you know, he doesn't sit there and go, you know what? Hey, let me go get somebody to help me. He doesn't say, let me, let me try to go to God and figure out how to, I can get a, a good answer. He just assumed that it was lost forever. This is how we seem to respond to every situation that happens. When change happens inside the church, instead of praying about it, instead of seeing the change from a biblical perspective, instead of asking questions and finding solutions, our first response is to do what? We like to complain and get angry. You know what I'm saying? We're having our business meeting today. After the second service, y'all can come do it if you want to. You don't have to. But guess what? We're going to be talking about change. Oh, no. Here's the thing. I hate business meetings. Because we go, as soon as we hear the word change, we're going to do something a little different. Everybody goes, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was borrowed, Amen. That church isn't ours. Why do you got to change everything, Abram? Eh, it's been like that way for 40 years. Change. I'm telling y'all now, see y'all on complain later. You know, see what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. uh, but we do it for everything. When we hear bad news from the doctor, instead of going to, to, to God who's a great physician, our first response is to get upset and complain. 
It's an understanding that even in the bad news, guess what? God is still working. We have to start seeing things from a perspective that is Christ-like as opposed to seeing things the world, the world sees. It. All right? We, we need to be like the Hallmark Channel as opposed to uh, CNN. CNN is always breaking news. It's always doom and gloom. You know, so always something is world-ending on CNN. It's correct, but Hallmark, you look at Hallmark Channel, it, it's always a happy ending. The, you know, a city girl goes on vacation to a small town. <laughs> <laughs> Falls in love with a local boy. Doesn't have a job, but he paints. <laughs> and, he, and she saw him painting the fence outside of her broken house, and she's just renting. Then she goes back to the city. Realizes that she loves that painter. <laughs> Who's still painting the fence when she comes back to this small town? The <laughs> went over. And she realizes she's not a city girl at all. She was actually meant to live in this uh, beat up house that she turns into a beautiful farmhouse. This is crazy. And you'll watch it every time. <laughs> you guys will watch those things. It's every movie, the same thing. And you guys are like, I gotta watch all my Christmas Hallmark movies. <laughs> Christmas Hallmark movies. Here's the thing I'll give it to the Hallmark. They always find a solution. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They always seem to find a solution. Here's my point. An immature Christian will always respond differently than a mature Christian who knows who has the authority over his life. When the disciples were on the boat, right, and the storm came, they acted very immature. They, they panic. They wake up Jesus, and they go, what? They say, we're going to die. They didn't say, hey, we're in the boat with Jesus. They go, Jesus, we're going to die. You gotta wake up. And, and what, is, what does Jesus say? Jesus wakes up and he says, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Don't you realize who is in the boat with you? The one who has the authority over the wind and the sea, the one who has the authority over darkness, the one who created all things visible and invisible. And the thing is true with us. What are you afraid of this morning? Don't we serve a big God who can do big things? Guys, as a pastor, I make a lot of mistakes, and I always tell I tell other pastors. That I pastor the greatest church because you guys are a forgiving church, all right? Y'all let me make mistakes and you're just like, oh, it's just Abram. Uh, and I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. But one mistake that I've never made was believing in a big God who can come to a small town and take over a small church and make a huge impact. I've never made that mistake, right? I believe you can grow a church like the Trinity to reach hundreds of thousands of people and change this town of Fountain. I went to Southern Elementary on Thursday. Amen. I went to Southern Elementary on Thursday during uh, their lunch with Mark and uh, walked around saying, not all the kids. Any kids see me on Thursday? Any kids here? Okay. Yes. Just a few of us. Who did? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he was. <laughs> That's right. I, it was the greatest thing, man. I, here's the thing. I went a couple years ago and none of the kids knew who I was. I went Thursday all of them knew me. Yeah. And the ones that didn't called me Paul Bunyan. <laughs> <laughs> I was, in their defense, I was wearing a flannel, so I'll give that to them. But, uh, <laughs> but it was incredible because they were like, if, if they weren't even from our church, they are like, hey, I was at the fireworks. Or you baptized my cousin, Eddie. Or, uh, I mean, it was just crazy how, how they, they knew me. And, and uh, one little girl... <laughs> One little girl asked if I, uh, if I was Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, I said, no. I said, no, my mom's white, my dad's black, and uh, I'm, I'm mixed. And she said, oh, okay. She said, uh, my mom hates black people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, but, I said, do you hate me? And she's like, no. I'm like, oh. Okay then, you don't hate all black people. And I'm like, here's the thing, you cannot, you cannot blame all people for the actions of one person. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I think that's what she did. I think, I think I get her dad got to fight with a black guy and put him in jail. So I don't know, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I told her, I said, we have more in common than you realize. I, I, she, had a, she had a thing of Oreos on her. I said, I love Oreos. You know what I'm saying? She, she didn't take a bite out of her. Vegetables. I said, I hate vegetables. You know? 
I, I said, I said, I think they're gross. They stuck your growth. <laughs> so I'm sure her racist mom loved them that I told her that. <laughs> but how we view things as younger or when we're immature is different when we're older. When I went to college right out of high school, I'd see a, I'd see an assignment that would say, write a 500 word paper. And I would lose sleep over. I would lose sleep over. And I would push it back. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta work on that, but I'll do it later. I, I need time. I need time to do that. That's, that's a big assignment. And uh, now I look at it as a paragraph. You know what I'm saying? It's a paragraph. 500 words is a paragraph. But boy, when I was younger, I used to really panic over these things, you know? Uh, there, there's this lady named uh, uh, Joni Erickson Todd. When she was 16, she dove into a shallow part of the ocean and, and broke her neck crushed her, her spinal cord, she became a quadriplegic, and she went through this unbelievable journey when she was younger. And uh, when she was younger, she, she prayed for healing. And she prayed for healing. And she prayed for healing. And it never came in the physical sense. Now, 50 years later, she, she, she's this unbelievable speaker. She traveled all over the world sharing her testimony. Thousands of people have come to know Christ because of her testimony, she, she paints just with the, 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 the brush in her mouth, and, and she has this extraordinary life. And she said when she was younger, if you were to ask her if she would want to walk again, she would have said, absolutely. In fact, she said, I, I'm praying for that. But if you were to ask her now, she says, no way. Because she said, God has used me and my story in such an incredible way. And she said, I have learned that the grace of God is sufficient for my needs. She said, every day she wakes up, she knows she needs God because she can't do it on her own. She said, every day she wakes up and she realizes that she cannot do anything without God. Jesus, I, I, here's a guy. We have to stop looking at burdens in the way the world wants us to see burdens. And we need to start recognizing that God's glory is in all things. This is why in Proverbs, he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The, 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 the immature in faith wants an explanation for everything. The immature in faith goes, I've got to explain everything that's happening in my life. But the mature in faith recognizes that God's presence is in everything. Even when they don't have an explanation. In an interview I was watching with Joni Tata, she said, Somebody spoke to her and shared with her something stuck with her. This person said, receive all inner and outer troubles. Receive all the dis disappointments, all the trials, all the discomforts, all the darkness and the desolation with an open arm as a blessed opportunity to die and enter in, into fuller fellowship with your Savior. He said, don't look at your burdens or trials from a worldly perspective. Realize that your distress is your spiritual prosperity. Paul said the same thing practically, a little simpler. Paul said, I got a thorn in my side. He begged God to take it out. God refused to take out the thorn. You want to know why? It was not because he was punishing Paul, but he wanted Paul to understand that his grace was sufficient. His power is made perfect in our weakness. Some of you need to realize that God brought you through things in your life, not for you to be bitter about. Not to be bitter about, but so you can share with somebody else who's going through the same thing, how to get through it. One thing I love about my classes at Clear Creek, probably one of the reasons I'm doing better than this go around than I was at KCU when I pumped out. I'm sitting there going, those, bro, those professors over at KCU never stepped foot inside of the church before. They, they, they weren't pastors, they were just professors. So everything they taught me, I go, you've never been in the church yet. You can't get away with this at this meeting. You know what I'm saying? At Clear Creek, these are actually pastors teaching us. And so they actually can sit there and say, I've been there before. This is how you handle this situation. It's one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life. And, and the same is true with us. It makes a world of difference. It's a lot easier for someone who has overcome an addiction to talk to an addict than somebody who's never done that before in their life. And one thing I love about our church is that we, we, we come from all sorts of walks of life. When I, go, when I go to the store, somebody from Trinity is there. Or somebody who knows somebody from Trinity is there. I went to McDonald's on Friday. Lady said, I just moved back to town. He said, all I hear about is that church of yours. All I hear about is that church. You walk in any of our, school, any of our schools, we got teachers in there. We got, we got nurses in there. We got cafeteria ladies in there. It's amazing. We're in every fabric of this town. And when pastors call me and ask me what crazy leadership philosophy I'm following to grow a church in a small, declining community, 
I tell them something's been passed down from generations. You understand this? What we're doing at Trinity is nothing fancy. We're singing hymns. I'm wearing suits. It's nothing crazy and, and oh my gosh. It's what I've been taught my entire life by older generations. It's what I've been taught. You know? I've learned from the mistakes of, of the church in our community. I've seen what has worked. And when I tell these pastors that I do all these things, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and that I preach about sin and we spend more money on local outreach than we do overseas missions, they get upset. Because they go, that's old fashioned. That's what they tell me. Hey, that's old fashioned. And I say, call whatever you want. But I don't have a, a, a band that has to be rehearsed a thousand times before they can get up and play a song you know, on Sunday morning. If I want to sing a song out of the blue, guess what? I can sing the song out of the blue. If I want to, if I want to start jumping around or dancing around, I ain't got a camera that I got to worry about following me. I'll just go dance around and jump around. I'll do whatever I want. You understand this? I went to one big church, massive church, and they go, Abram, see the X on the ground? I mean, the stage was ten times the size of the stage. They go, you see that X on the ground right in the center? I said, yeah, yeah. They go, don't move from that X. Like, what if I just like, just move like this? No, no, no. The camera won't be, you won't be in the camera. You got to stay on the X. I'm like, okay. What, what if I want to come down and like, I don't know. What if I want to, what if I need to, what if I get hurt? I need, no, no, do not leave the X. <laughs> so there I stood. I was more nervous about leaving the X than I was preaching, you know. But, but here's my point, guys. I want the Holy Spirit to lead us. I want the Holy Spirit to lead us. And if that's old-fashioned, then that's old-fashioned. We'll be old-fashioned until the day I die, right? If you put your trust in God today, I promise you, it'll be the best decision you'll ever make in your entire life. He, he, he will make the lead you're singing. He will. Reminds me of that old song. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. With his redeeming blood, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save us. Precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. 